It's my absolute pleasure to be here uh, to share with you some thoughts about what I think of as one of the most remarkable trends in terms of the world economy, which is Easternization. The growth of China leading the emergence of Asia and what to look for in the years ahead when it comes to what that rise means for energy use. Now, I'm going to speak to you about a few, as I say, of these big picture themes around energy. And I will have a few moments. Um, I would love to get your thoughts, your questions, your comments. So I have brought with me um, this iPad. So if you were to enter any questions or comments into your app, I'll be able to pick those up. And I would very much look forward uh, to hearing um, what interests you in terms of this topic. So that's the event code uh, for you to access uh, the interactive part of this speech. So what I want to focus on, as I say, is firstly, the rise of China. Now, quite often, when we think about China's growth, the recent slowdown in its growth and questions around how sustainable is China's economic development, those, I think, are precursor questions to answer before we believe this trend towards Easternization and the rise of Asia. After all, there are very few countries that have grown well for a sustained period. And China is the only major economy to have done so, um, to go from a developing country, poorer than Africa in 1990, to becoming the world's second biggest economy in 30 years of uninterrupted growth. Now, this, to sustain that growth will require revisiting China's growth drivers. And as China revisits its growth drivers, there will be implications for its use of energy. Because after all, China is a dominant uh, source of demand for fossil fuels and increasingly for renewables. So let me talk you through what has driven China's growth since market-oriented reforms began in 1979 and how its growth drivers are shifting and what that means for continued demand for things like oil, gas, and renewables. So the first thing to say is China's growth has been remarkable. 9.6% average growth for over 30 years um, is a feat that I think only two other countries have come close to, to doing. Um, but if you look at the drivers of that growth, the old mix won't be sufficient to drive China's growth in the coming years. So China's at a point where it's facing the middle income country trap. It needs to change its growth drivers to become one of the few countries, only 13 countries have become rich since World War II, which is a very small number. To join that group will require looking again at shifting the contributions to its growth. So since 79, 60 to 70% of China's growth comes from adding factors like capital and workers. The rest comes from productivity, total factor productivity, TFP. If you look at the factors, half of China's growth comes from investment, capital accumulation. That's a very standard way of growing for a developing country. And adding workers has also played a role, but relatively less so. Looking ahead, China's investing heavily in human capital, so it needs to raise its contributions from workers, educated workers, skilled workers, relative to investment, which is one of the causes of its debt issue, to shift its growth towards a mix that's more consistent with the upper middle income country seeking to become prosperous. More skilled workers also implies more innovators, and if you look at what's driven China's productivity growth since 1979, about a third has come from human capital. Human capital, this share, is higher for advanced economies. 
And one of the areas in which China is significantly innovating is in green energy. Um, and this focus on training workers, promoting innovation, increasing higher education, boosting skills, um, that share is part of the reforms that China is undertaking in order to raise the share of growth that comes from human capital, which is a sustainable source of growth. About a third of China's growth has come from reallocation, moving factors from less efficient to more efficient sectors, moving workers from state-owned enterprises to the private sector. But those are one-off policy changes that won't be repeated on the same scale in the future, which means, more than ever, China needs to focus on innovation. Right now, it's about a third of what drives China's productivity growth. But that share needs to increase substantially, especially the part attributed to domestic indigenous innovation. So research suggests that up to two thirds of Chinese innovation comes from imitation, which is a very common trait for developing countries that are catching up to the technology frontier. But that also is why China, since the mid-1990s, so this has been going on for over two decades, has been focused on raising innovation. And there are some very innovative Chinese firms already. And increasing their share in the economy will be key to sustaining China's growth and sustaining a trend where China, leading the East Asia nation, is transforming where consumers, where demand is coming from in the world economy. So the new global middle class is emerging. And a lot of these middle class are in China, are in Asia. And if Chinese reforms continue, and we also see significant prospects in terms of effective development in the region, we could be on the cusp of seeing a new global middle class that will look very different than what we have today. The very first thing to say is not just strictly Asia. Emerging economies have overtaken developed economies in terms of their share of world output since the 2008 banking crisis. But it's not a one-off. The trend, as predicted, by the International Monetary Fund and others is that emerging economies will increasingly account for a greater share of the global economy. Why? Why well, I mentioned this new middle class. The very first cause of the growth of this middle class is the extraordinary progress made against poverty since 1990. Over a billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty between 1990 and 2010. Over a third of the world was extremely poor then, and now we are at a historic point where 10% of the world population live on less than $1.90 per day, adjusted for what a dollar buys in their country. By 2030, the aim is to eradicate extreme poverty as part of the Sustainable Development Goals adopted by the United Nations for all countries in the world. And the remarkable growth of China is a huge factor in terms of this successful poverty uh, reduction. And China and the Asian region as a whole is on the cusp of eradicating extreme poverty before 2030. Fewer people in poverty means more people entering the middle class. So in 2009, there were about 1.8 billion people who were earning between 10 to $100 per day, adjusted for what a dollar buys in their country. By 2020, that is only two years from now, that number is expected to nearly double to 3.2 billion people in the global middle class. If Chinese reforms continue, and the Asian region continues to make the substantial progress that we have seen since 1990, as well as other emerging economies, the trend I showed you earlier, increasingly accounting for a greater share of global GDP, then by 2030, 
it's quite possible that for the first time in history, more than half of the global population will be middle class. 4.9 billion people out of an estimated 8.6 billion people on the planet will enjoy middle income status, a middle class standard of living. The implication in terms of welfare is astounding. Of course, there are energy implications, which I will come to as well. But of course, if we do get to that point, that will be a remarkable turning point. And the bulk of the middle class will be found in Asia. So at the moment, more than half of the middle class are in the West, in North America, in Europe. This is where you find the consumers of today. But by 2030, if these trends of economic development continue, then two-thirds of the middle class will be found in Asia. So where we now look to American consumers or European consumers, it will be a very different picture in just over a decade from now. Now, this shift in terms of economic demand and weight is a historic event that hasn't been seen for 150 years, according to the United Nations. So this new global middle class that's emerging would fundamentally transform not just the world economy, but also how we view culture influence, where demand comes from, where the weight of economic activity resides. Now, I travel a great deal. And so my favorite indicator of ascendancy is airports. So this is a survey which is done by Skytrax. So Skytrax surveys passengers, and in their survey, they find, and it's pretty consistent um, across different surveys over time, that half of the best airports in the world are found in Asia. Um, but you'll be happy to see uh, the Middle East makes it on there as well, um, a couple of airports from Europe, uh, but no U.S. airports. And uh, airports are an indicator of lots of things, but business travel, government investment, tourism, all of these things, I think, are picked up. But I personally have doubts about the survey uh, because Heathrow made it onto the list. Um, so what does all of this mean in terms of the new energy mix that we might expect, and particularly for the UAE and for this region? I think focusing on China, of course, the biggest source of demand for energy, especially as its consumption of energy is going to change from being a producing uh, mostly for production, so for producing things, into more consumption-based uh, consumption of energy. So that's part of the reforms that China is undertaking. I've talked about human capital. I've talked about increasing innovation. The other part of Chinese reforms, as it hopes to become prosperous and overcome the middle-income country trap, is to rely less on selling to consumers overseas and more on its own consumers, which is a natural evolution of a country which over, it's only since the last decade, has had its own upper middle class consumers, but also over the last decade, the emergence of some really innovative companies selling uh, products, goods, and services which are being demanded uh, by the Chinese consumers. So this combination means that China's reorientation towards domestic demand means that the energy that it used to demand, the raw materials, the resources that mostly went into manufacturing is now going to be used to fuel consumption. And in terms of this, sh this new energy mix, the Chinese government recognizes, of course, they use half of all the coal in the world uh, but they have invested more in renewables, especially solar, over 
the past few years, especially as part of the investment in R&D and innovation push that I mentioned earlier, which began two decades ago. In fact, China has invested more in renewables than all other nations combined over the last few years. So it's a substantial push. And the aim is that by 2030, China increases the share of renewables in its energy mix from about a tenth use that account that renewables accounts for up to a fifth, 20 percent. So that's a doubling um, in just the decade. Um, and as I said a moment ago, this is prefaced by the fact that Chinese consumption of energy is now more geared towards consumers and services rather than manufacturing. And so the mix reflects its economic development trend. In fact, China is still the factory of the world, but China's services sector is larger than its manufacturing or production sector. And China's domestic demand, domestic consumption, domestic investment, um, is also the main driver of growth. Net exports hasn't contributed much to Chinese growth over the past few years. So China rebalancing its economy goes hand in hand with a refocus in terms of how it's adjusting its demand and use of energy. China also expects by 2030 that greenhouse gas emissions will peak then. And you see some really significant efforts, not just by the Chinese central national government, but also by localities. So Beijing, for instance, has a three-year plan which will move a lot of the factories out of Beijing city proper and further south in Hebei province, um, which would help improve uh, pollution, uh, but as I say, also reflecting the fact the space vacated will be used more for services-oriented businesses and industries to serve China's middle class. But of course, that's not the only driver of China's energy mix. The Belt and Road Initiative um, is a substantial overseas investment project um, undertaken by China with 60-some countries involved in the New Silk Road, as well as a maritime route that takes Chinese investment across South Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, East Africa, and of course, here into the Middle East, both the maritime and the overland route. China plans to invest up to a trillion dollars in the next five years. About 800 billion of that is in the Belt and Road Initiative itself, road projects, infrastructure projects, energy projects, um, and another 200 billion will be placed in the new Silk Road Fund. In terms of what this means for energy, this means that China is going to continue to produce, which has been the traditional source of demanding um, oil and fossil fuels, for instance, but China's also investing in green energy in terms of these projects. That initiative, plus the fact that China, in a very um, forward-looking way, in terms of its economic planning, this has no intention of uh, giving up on manufacturing. Um, so by 2025, China intends to have artificial intelligence-based uh, manufacturing and production to create world-beating multinational companies. So. Part of the outward push is this infrastructure investment. Part of it is Chinese companies going global. And of course, all of that suggests continuing demand for sources of energy that fuel production. In fact, one headline today is that Alibaba, a Chinese e-commerce company, which is the biggest in the world, it's bigger than Amazon, um, it and Microsoft have created artificial intelligence that has beaten human beings in a reading comprehension test conducted at Stanford University. Um, if robots can read better than we can, 
Um, I'm a little frightened, but I think this suggests there's quite a lot of uh, change in how we should expect AI, especially to affect uh, production in the coming years. So finally, a few concluding thoughts, um, and then I'll um, take um, the questions that I see which are kindly coming through. Um, Easternization points to a shift in the global economy or reorienting where we look to find demand from west to east. China is leading um, the emergence of this new global middle class that's found in Asia. This new trend will lead to a new energy mix with a focus on both green energy renewables, but also on fossil fuels. The different countries in Asia alongside China, they are still industrializing or re-industrializing, upgrading into AI, more technology-focused industries for those countries which are more developed. So long as these Asian countries, including China, continues to focus on manufacturing, as well as in China's case, focusing on infrastructure investment, which is very much needed in the world economy, there's an infrastructure-funded gap in the world, that trend will continue alongside the rise of consumers. And that, I think, will be the two major uh, factors which will um, influence the kind of energy that's demanded and invested in in the years to come. Now, um, let me uh, take uh, this question that's come through. Um, what potential impact could Easternization have on the economic development of the GCC? I think a substantial one. I think looking to Asia in terms of what its consumers and what its industrial needs are, um, I think fits very nicely with the theme of the summit, which is uh, looking to think about how renewables, how green energy is going to impact the traditional energy mix. And of course, for this region, the GCC, there's also the issue of China's Belt and Road Initiative, as I say, coming through this region, partnering with Chinese investment to develop some very much needed um, infrastructure, ports, road, rail, and not just in this region, but helping, um, working with um, Chinese um, investors as they develop East Africa, North Africa, Central Asia. I think all of that will have an impact in terms of uh, where this region with its expertise in terms of energy financing and long experience um, in terms of the sector will be, I think, really quite valuable. Um, I have time just to take one, uh, one more question. Um, if trade and commerce has more of an Eastern focus, what could that mean for Western economies? Um, another great question. Um, you should not take anything that I say to suggest the West is in decline. <laughs> it's a relative shift. Um, the West is wealthy. The West will continue to have high standards of living. But the rapid growth of Asian countries suggests that they will become a relatively more important part of the world economy. And in terms of world GDP, better matching globally where the population is, where the people are that produce output, um, this is, I mentioned earlier, a trend not seen for 150 years. So this goes back to 150 years ago in the 19th century when global GDP better matched um, the world population. So please don't take anything I say to suggest we shouldn't look to the West, <laughs> but what I am suggesting is it's a much more complicated picture um, in terms of where demand, consumers, production, investment, funding, energy investment, innovation, a green innovation is going to come from. Um, but that does suggest um, that we all need to get our skates on because as Asia grows rapidly and changes so rapidly, um, it's going to be harder to keep up. And that's the case, I think, for the West as well as for um, anyone else um, looking to uh, get their head around this tremendous change in the world economy. I, for one, I'll conclude on this thought, am very hopeful that we will get to a point 
where the global middle class is largely found in Asia because of substantial poverty reduction in the region. Um, sometimes um, when I give this speech, I know there's a degree of concern if we'll ever get there. Um, but as Nelson Mandela says, said, um, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you very much.